Good evening, Somerville. This is Wojtek Malewski, music director of your Somerville Orchestra, coming to you not so live. Unfortunately, not from the Dorchester County Library. Sadly, due to COVID, that can't be right. Unfortunately, it is right. Uh, we are not able to be in the library this month, but hopefully if things die down and calm down next month, we'll be back in person for our monthly music chats. However, this month we have a special treat. We're uploading a sp special, special treat uh, of the music of Charleston via digital Zoom. So what we had scheduled was our clarinets in person, live demonstrations and things of that nature. But unfortunately, since we can't be live, the clarinets and I have decided we will wait until we can be live. So stay tuned for more information on the February and March uh, music chats and what the topic is going to be. For now, let's dive in and have some fun. This is going to serve as a sort of a brief survey tonight, but it also hopefully might get you interested and excited and ready for our upcoming concert in February. So I hope you are ready to go on this quick and fun musical journey with me tonight, all about the music of Charleston. That's right. Uh, historically, today, you name it, we're going to talk about it and tell you all about how it relates to our upcoming February concert. Now, let me just start off with a caveat that all of the things we're going to be talking about in today's presentation are meant to be a little teaser, a little sampler. So I'm not going to go too in-depth on any one topic. It's going to be very hard for me. But you'll just have to come out for our concert and hear more. And maybe check out our program notes and hear our pre-concert lecture and basically just come out and have a good time in February. But for now, let's dive into it, shall we? So the music of Charleston, when I tell you, when I ask you, you know, what do you think about when you think of music in Charleston or the, or the Charleston music today, what do you think of? Do you think orchestral right away? Do you think jazz? Do you think folk? Do you think uh, musicians at a bar? Do you think, what do you think of? High Water Festival? Do you think, what, you know, what comes to mind? If I were to ask you, hey, What's the last thing you saw in town? What's the last musical thing you saw? Or what do you just what do you generally think of? I'm curious to know what you think. Write in the comments below because I am curious what the consensus on all of this is. Um, but something tells me it's because you're listening to this presentation that you're going to say orchestras. That's fine. That's good. We like we like that here at the Somerville Orchestra. Speaking of, by the way, <clears throat> if you like and are enjoying this video, make sure to smash that subscribe button below. Uh, that helps us give you more content that's relevant to you, such as these fantastic fun videos. So without any further ado, you know, the sur survey says that the Charleston music scene today is very vibrant. It's very cosmopolitan and it's very diverse. You can easily hear an orchestra as easily as you can hear some sort of na native folk music as easily as some really kind of traditional, beautifully played and sung and performed church music as much as you can, well, you get the picture. It's very diverse. And that has some historical roots and basis, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but it also has some native influences as well. Um, let's start with jazz because that's a really, really fun topic to talk about. Uh, today's premiere jazz orchestra in town is, of course, CJO, Charleston's very own professional jazz big band. Uh, apart, in addition to them, there's a few different performance spaces around town that are strictly dedicated to jazz performance, like the Commodore and Forte. Uh, I believe there's one or two more, but I don't remember their names. They didn't make it in here. There is also now a sort of a house big band at Forte Jazz Lounge. It's called the Joe Clark Big Band, which is a lot of fun to go check them out. If you're ever walking down King Street, make sure to stop on into Forte. Something's always happening there. And of course, Gino Castillo and the Cuban Cowboys, if you want to hear some really good Latin jazz, uh, some sort of great native music, um, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic music. Of course, here in Somerville, we have our very, very own So Jazzy Ensemble, uh, which is a rotating sort of six to eight piece ensemble that jumps around here and there. And in fact, we'll be in Cane Bay, in Del Webb Cane Bay, February 5th. So if you're a resident of Del Webb Cane Bay, make sure to come on out on February 5th at 2 o'clock. Shameless plug. Anyway, moving on. Uh, orchestral Classical, of course, you already know about the Somerville Orchestra since you are tuned in here tonight. 
Charleston. But of course, uh, this town would be nothing without the Charleston Symphony, our professional and fantastic orchestra, um, as well as its other components like the Youth Symphony and its symphony chorus. Uh, of course, it's part of Spoleto Festival. And, uh, sorry, not part of Spoleto, that's a whole other... Spoleto Festival is also a part of Charleston is what I meant to say, but I was actually looking at to see why on earth my slide is actually cut off on the bottom here. That's just not going to work. We're not going to, we don't like that. So we're going to just, there we go. That's better. I'm not sure why that was cut off. I apologize to CFC Opera and Halo. Uh, so on the very bottom of here, we also have choral groups that you may have seen the Taylor Festival Choir. King's Counterpoint is another fantastic group in town here. Of course, the collegiate choirs, the high school choirs here in town. There's an abundance of vocal choral music, and it has a long and very rich tradition and history here in town. So I'm really, really excited to share that with you all. Of course, opera is getting a foothold and a start here locally. We have two companies here in town now. Charleston Opera Theater and Holy City Arts and Lyric Opera, as well as the College of Charleston Opera Program itself. Uh, so there's a lot of different diverse classical orchestral slash just traditional uh, music in that sense that I'm thrilled to be a part of. There's also a really diverse folk scene here in town, um, both honoring the native sort of cultures, the Gullah Geechee traditions, um, which are, tr you know, transferred down to us uh, either through, you know, gospel music, Baptist music traditions, or groups like Ranky Tanky that is pictured here, um, which I believe they're, I don't even know where they are in this photo, but it just looks absolutely beautiful. And how Charleston is that? A live oak in the background. Not only do we have Ranky Tanky, but we also have Hootie and the Blowfish, uh, Darius Rucker is a native son of Charleston and the High Water Festival, which is sort of a national caliber folk, bluegrass, it's hard to say country, it sort of used to be, but uh, definitely a sort of a folk indie style uh, festival here in town, which is nationally acclaimed now. And you can hear this type of music anywhere in town, anywhere and everywhere, um, including your local church probably. So uh, one thing I really want to start off with here is the Kumbaya, which I have highlighted here in blue. Not many people know, but it's becoming more and more well known that the song Kumbaya, which many of us grew up singing in school, is now, we finally know, is part of South Carolina heritage and history. It's native to the Gullah and Geechee culture. It comes to us from there. It literally translates to come by here. Uh, and it is absolutely a beautiful piece of music. Uh, recently, the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra and conductor John Morris Russell, who is actually also the music director down in Hilton Head, um, commissioned uh, Tim Behrens to write an arrangement of Kumbaya for orchestra and for four youth soloists. And I'd love to play a little clip of that for you tonight. Absolutely adorable these little kids are. a great arrangement. Uh, I wish we had more time to go through all of it, but just a little, it's a little taste. It's a little, little teaser, little, little here and there for you. Um, we hope to be able to do this arrangement some, sometime here in the Charleston area, maybe even next year. If you really like that, let us know in the comments below. We might just be able to do it, but hey, the more you tell us, the more we're inclined to listen. That's how things work, right? So if you liked that, let us know. So let's dive back into the PowerPoint now. So the question is, how did we get there? How did we get to such a diverse and really wide-ranging sort of sound uh, scape like this? And you could kind of argue, you know, Charleston's a bigger city now, so okay, you know, it's, you know, it's meant to be like this, but there's something really unique and special to the Charleston music scene. It's really, it's heavy influence of jazz and native music. 
but also now how strong this sort of connection and bridge to Europe is through the Spoleto Festival that was started in 1977, um, and this very, very rich choral tradition here in town. They all have very strong historical elements to them, and let's just dive right in and talk about them, shall we? So pre-revolution, Charleston was the crown jewel of the British colonies. We, we may or may not know that it was the most important port city in the time, by far the largest Atlantic Ocean hub of commerce. The African slave trade ran through here. It's an estimated, estimated now that 40% of all Africans imported to the U.S. came from Charleston. Um, it was America's fourth, fourth largest city. I can't speak tonight. I'm not sure why. It's fourth largest city by 1742. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps, let me just get my face away from here. Oh, okay, well, I'm not sure why. There we go. Uh, it was a chief point of attraction for professional musicians from Europe. That's important because Charleston was seen as sort of the new home. It's the new world. It's the new frontier. As a musician, professionally, if I can't really make it in Paris or London, I might just go try in this new place where there's no one established yet. Maybe I'll be the one to help establish it. So it's a very rich city, a very diverse city, a very important city, for lack of a better word. No, no shame to say that it was probably as, if not more important, than places like New York and Philadelphia. Uh, so let's, I'll give you this quote here, which is amazing. It says, Charleston approached more nearly the social refinement of a great European capital than any other American city. Sort of in keeping with what I just said about New York and Philly and all those northeastern big cities. It's a quote by Edmund Burke, and here behind, um, behind me is this beautiful painting, uh, and I forget the year. I want to say it's from 1695, and, you know, I'm going to, I would love to pause for a second and have you think. I do this with every audience I give this painting to, and I would like, like for you to tell me, is this a painting from depicting a European villa? Or does this represent a Charleston type of magnolia plantation or the Woodlands Preserve or any type of other sort of plantation, Middleton maybe, who knows? Is this European or is this Charleston? Let us know in the comments what you think. I'll give you a second to type out your answers, especially for those of us that still type with one finger. I still do that sometimes. It's very fun. All right, I think we all have our answers in by now. This is, in fact, sadly, it's not Charleston, even though I wish it was, but it has a very con spe special connection to Charleston. And this is actually depicting King Charles II, and with him is most likely his gardener, and his gardener is presenting him something, and I'm not sure if you can actually see that, but, and I don't even know if I have a pointer on my screen, but what you should be able to see is what he's holding in his hand, which looks like sort of a V, and this kind of weird looking thing in the middle. It in fact is a pineapple. That's right, one of the very first, if not the first, pictorial depiction of a pineapple, 1695. Now where on earth and why on earth would there be a pineapple in England at this time? Well, King Charles was fascinated with exotic places and exotic things like apparently fruit. And this was brought to him, and it's very likely that this pineapple came to him through Charleston. Um, we're not sure, of course, that, that's no way to know, but it's interesting to note that the king that's very largely responsible for the development of our own city here, uh, Charleston, is also seen here depicted with a pineapple. So, by the way, the pineapple, of course, is the symbol of Charleston itself as a city. How many of you knew that? Hopefully all of you. But if you didn't, well, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help educate. That's right. So diving on the early days of Charleston music. Now, pre-1700, sort of around when that photo, photo, my goodness. Although I guess in 200 years, people will say that about us too. When that painting was painted, uh, psalmody and hymnody was the primary music of Charleston. Basically what that means, the singing of psalms and divine worship. Um, and through this also, it offered musical and devotional training to the citizens of the city. Uh, by 1732, uh, the second public concert ever given in the colonies took place in Charleston. It was the first one in the South. Now, this is really cool because Charleston, historically, is a city of firsts for music. A lot of cool things happened here first, and that was one, of, one example of them. 
And so these European classical tastes were brought over and cultivated and really nourished here. So we have this really cool, beautiful religious music being developed here while we also have this sort of a secular music being developed here, especially operatic and vocal traditions. Uh, for example, the Irish, Scottish, English, all the Anglo-Saxon settlers brought with them a secular music tradition, especially the one, the oral tradition of the ballad. Now, the English Ballad Opera Company was formed here soon after to tell the, tell the tales, to tell the vocal tales, uh, especially with the help of music, of course. We know that now as opera. We didn't back then. They used to be called ballads. <clears throat> and so this company was founded to tell us these musical stories. I mentioned it's a city of firsts. A few years after that, the first opera produced in the United States happened exactly here on this soil in Charleston. Uh, and it was Flora, a very successful British ballad opera at the time, although now very obscure. Uh, it was performed and premiered in the makeshift sort of theater in the courtroom, believe it or not, above a tavern. So yes, the very first opera premiered in Charleston happened at a bar. And then, oh, by the way, there's a courthouse above it. I love that juxtaposition. That's, a, that's a, absolutely amazing. One year later, it was performed at the brand new Dock Street Theater. And the Dock Street was, of course, home to opera and plays and all sorts of performances for many, 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 many years until it burnt down. Then it was rebuilt. Of course, now we still call it home to many important and big theater and musical theater productions here in town. <clears throat> Opera's not as much anymore, sadly, but maybe we'll change that one day. Uh, many successful operas followed from Europe and were performed regularly here in the city. In 1762, the first and oldest musical society was created here, the St. Cecilia Society. Additional ones sprang up, and these offered free music training to, its, to the citizens of the city. Uh, it gave you sort of a good fundamental tools in education, uh, gave concerts. Eventually, it became a very sort of high, high society sort of place. Um, but it began very modestly as an educational development center. Very exciting. <clears throat> and another first here is this collection of psalms and hymns from 1737 by John Wesley. You may know the name John Wesley. In fact, I did this presentation at the village uh, not too long ago, and somebody recognized the name John Wesley and his brother. It's very possible if you walk into any church today and you open a hymnal, and you look down and you look at the names of the people who wrote the text or who wrote the music, you'll either see Mr. John Wesley or his brother's name in the book. And that is no coincidence. The first ever hymnal and psalm book in the United States came to us from Charleston in 1737. Uh, back then, it was, it was actually a radical practice of, of hymnody. Uh, it, was, it was sort of a first of its kind. It translated German hymns and, you know, these are taken by missionaries. Uh, of course, back then, we're, we're talking about the days where secular Latin, uh, oh my gosh, Latin was the, the language of the church. Um, and then with the Reformation and with all these other things happening, the practice of singing in, in sort of a native tongue was, whoo, crazy, radical. So it presents a very tangible link between sort of the Methodist church and hymnody and the American colonies. And this musical tradition grew and grew and grew here. <clears throat> And I want to sort of give you two quotes of the, of, about the time. The general pattern of 18th century America was the imitation of European standards of taste. That's from a great book by Gilbert Chase, uh, The History of American Music. And also in the liberal 18th century attitude, there was room for all famous masters and local lights, professionals, amateurs, immigrants, and native norms. The important thing was to have music, a lot of it, and the best that could be had. I really think you can say the same thing today about Charleston. The important thing is to just have a lot of music, as much as you can, and the best that could be had. Although I guess you could say that for any city, but I think it really applies here, especially this idea of professionals and amateurs playing together. Let's talk about that. Um, so I'm going to move my face. I'm going to put it right here. So just so you can see what I wrote here, but <clears throat> the gentleman that's now currently behind me is a man by the name of Theodore Pachelbel. Theodore Pachelbel is the son of Johann, that's right, of the famous Pachelbel Canons in D. If you've been to a wedding, you've heard it. Uh, and he came here in 1737, emigrated from Rhode Island. Oh, that's from, not to, whoops. 
And then he gave concerts in New York in 1736 before coming to Charleston one year later. In 1760, <clears throat> a concert of vocal and instrumental music was given here in town to be given with the assistance of gentlemen, who are the best performers both in town and country. Now, this word gentlemen that's capitalized refers to amateur musicians. It refers to amateurs who are not professional musicians but loved to play. And oftentimes, in, in areas such as Charleston that were not like Paris and London, there probably weren't enough professional musicians to make up an entire ensemble. And so you'd fill the ranks with really high-level amateur players from the community. And that's sort of how you built your um, community ensemble, for lack of a better word. Uh, this is a practice that's very commonly done in today's cities as well. We don't really call it that anymore, obviously. We call it either you know a regional orchestra, or sometimes we call it community orchestra. Sometimes they're one and the same. Sometimes they're... But anyway, this is where the idea came from, is filling the ranks with really, really high-skilled players that are pros and amateurs right next to one another. Rapid growth, of course. So we mentioned that Charleston was the fourth largest city by 1762. And this really continued uh, throughout its colonial days. Uh, at that point, agricultural economy was quite important, and that's partnered with the fact that there's a pretty important port here in Charleston that served as a gateway of commerce. And so you can imagine the city grew very rapidly. By the way, that painting uh, of, of, of Charleston Harbor back there doesn't look too different than it does today, does it? And I love that about our city is that it doesn't, hasn't gotten too tall and it hasn't gotten away from its historical roots. Kind of love that. <clears throat> it was the wealthiest city in the colonies by 1775. Um, and like I mentioned, various different reasons. It was the largest population south of Philadelphia. It had 11,000 inhabitants in 1770. It may not seem like a lot, but the very fact that it was the largest city south of Philly in 1770, that's right pre-revolution, that says a lot. And soon, three, the three conditions for art were in abundance, and those are population, wealth, and leisure. Now let's talk about those for a second because those are really the conditions you need to make really good art. You need a growing population or a population that's moving here, you know, or the town's growing rapidly, literally in numbers. You need wealth. You need an economy that's growing. You need people to be making a lot of money so they can spend money. Uh, you need a place that's, of course, thriving. Things are growing. Businesses are opening, etc. And leisure. You need people to have time, and that's a good sort of a work-life balance. You need opportunities for leisure as well, whether it's physical venues or offerings like music itself. So those conditions, if you think about Charleston today, really, that's a, we're sort of in a weird nebulous time. When I first started writing a presentation about the history of Charleston music, this was the year, oh, I don't know, 2019, the, the year before it all went downhill and COVID struck. I think back then we were exactly in that same position where all three of these factors were in very much in sync. The city was growing rapidly, population, it was a big thriving economy, things were kept opening and businesses kept opening and restaurants kept opening. And of course people had all this opportunity to go out and do things and then everything shut down and we couldn't do that anymore. So. One could argue we're not going to have that debate tonight whether or not you think Charleston is still in those three conditions or not. That's not why we're here. But I'm curious what you think, so let me know. Let's go on here, though. Um, anyway, when these three factors assume a large portion, proportion in any society, rather, the consumption of art tends to increase and may indeed become itself a major economic enterprise. That's what happened to Charleston historically. It also happened to Charleston pre-COVID as well. And in fact, I forget the exact percentage number, but there was a study done not too long ago of just how much of an economic impact do orchestras have on a town. And when you think about it, it's quite sprawling because maybe sometimes you'll take a cab to the, to the orchestral hall. The hall itself employs many people. Inside the hall, you may have um, you know, a little cafe area, a little restaurant. When you leave the orchestral hall and you've supported your local artistic establishment, then you probably may go to a restaurant or two, maybe a bar, and then you may go with some friends, take the transportation system somewhere else, 
and make and come home and call it a night. So already you've impacted the economic footprint of your area so much by simply attending an, an event. And this is actually a beautiful thing. So sort of amazing how these things in tandem work together. Um, but let's talk about the economic things uh, because Charleston, unfortunately, has a you know, pretty dark past with how the economy boomed here. Slavery, of course, was a big, big proponent of this because, uh, like we mentioned before, 40% of all slaves came to America uh, from Africa through this port here in town to fill the agricultural needs, the labor needs of this plantation economy that Charleston had and South Carolina really had and honestly most of the South had, let's be real. Um, prior to the African slave trade, the Indian slave trade, or rather the Native American slave trade, was massive. And this actually wasn't even begun by American colonists. It was actually begun by French colonists back in the days pre-Louisiana Purchase. Um, this was a very, very common practice. Um, but anyway, as was noted before, 40% uh, of Africans came here. Uh, by the end of the slave trade, it was up to 50% of total uh, slaves coming into the States came through here. From various parts of the African continent, but predominantly the West Coast, which is shown in the picture right above me, uh, also known as the Rice Coast. Uh, countries such as Guinea and the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Benin, etc., etc., etc. And they brought with them various facets of their own culture and populations, food, traditions, etc., you name it. Uh, and this would serve a very important purpose uh, because it led to this creation of the Gullah Geechee culture. This culture of the, you know, slaves being brought over, mixing with the native uh, sort of people that were here, and this creation of a, of a musical heritage, of a church heritage, of a, just a communal heritage, a musical tradition. And it's a beautiful sort of Creole culture that developed in the colonies and still exists today. Actually, if you go to um, Sapelo Island, that's still a very, very um, big home to the Gullah culture. And we have groups like Ranky Tanky to thank for continuing to give us this musical tradition. Um, but anyway, so these plantations had hundreds and hundreds of laborers. And so they had to communicate with each other somehow. They did this through music, through chanting, through singing. These work and field songs became quite important and became quite important not only during those times, but still later on after slavery was over, they grew to impact so much. They influenced composers like Dvorak, like Florence Price, like Edmund Jenkins, who we'll talk about, and even George Gershwin. So we'll talk about all the impact that those had, but it sort of began here. Of course, post-revolution, like with any war, that's going to throw off everything on its axis. Uh, musicians and populations really began to drift north to New York, where the industrial boom was happening, the machine era. Um, things were growing rapidly, the steam engine, as, you know, the light bulb, all these discoveries and big, big, big evolutions. To, not the light bulb, that was way later, but you know what I mean. It was a big industrial boom is what I'm trying to say. And so the United States in the north became this really important place of growth and development. The South continued sort of its agricultural uh, economic foundation that sort of let it grow to become that rich, while the North sort of evolved into this really different type of uh, e economic force. <clears throat> well, by 1819, European classical music here in Charleston still thrived. Uh, in fact, the first 30-person orchestra was formed in that year. They performed intimate concerts for family and friends. And they were comprised of professionals and amateurs, like I mentioned before. Those two usually went together. Picture, again, sort of, oh, this way. Nope, this way. Oh, my goodness. This way. That's completely opposite. Uh, is the Siegling Music House on King Street, uh, which opened in 1819 and closed, I want to say, somewhere in the 1970s, if not the 1980s. Uh, I did this presentation not too long ago, and somebody told me, you know, I remember the Siegling Music House, and you could go in there and buy some sheet music and pianos. So amazing, amazing, amazing part of history here. But it's, it's weird to think that this started after the revolution, where there was a need for music because it had went away. Probably a lot of musicians moved away from town. Well, you still wanted that, and so you'd probably bring it into your own home. And the way to do it back then was to probably have a piano, or a violin or something and buy sheet music and perform it in your own home or maybe just go to church and sing it. And the best way to do communal music at the time was through the church, unless you wanted your own sort of little music traditions in your own house. And this became a really important resource
for local citizens. As time went on, things developed and grew, and once again, war comes to us. This time, the Civil War, which completely devastated and wrecked the economy of South Carolina because, well, you couldn't rely on the thing you had to rely on for so long, which is labor. Um, and all of a sudden, slavery is abolished. Uh, the croplands and the plantations, everything is on fire, destroyed. Uh, cities are in ruins. And it really was a bit of a dark time. Uh, Reconstruction era really kind of went slowly and slowly. Ironically, though, in the middle of all this, uh, two really important musical houses were built in South Carolina. One in Newberry, right outside of Columbia, the Newberry Opera House, which is beautiful. And in Charleston, the Charleston Conservatory was founded in 1884. Very important historical moments, so ironically, in the middle of a sort of a depression, if you will. Um, in 1891, to combat this sort of, I guess if you would say, really low points in, in, in South Carolina's history, you have to imagine the time, This the I kind of painted a picture before, the economy's in ruins, the cities and fields are literally in ruins, and with it you have this mass of really peasant black labor with really few land rights here, you couldn't buy land, um, for, you know, and there's a lot of despair, a lot of poverty in the population. And so a pastor by the name of Edmund Jenkins moved here from uh, Arkansas, and he and he opened a, an orphanage in 1891 and 1892 to combat this sort of poverty. He was not only a, a pastor, he was a successful businessman. He soon became friends with the Charleston, with the mayor of Charleston, sat on city council, and he himself was an ex-slave, so he can really relate to the plight of these uh, peasant workers that couldn't find a home, and especially took their kids in, especially the ones off the streets, gave them things to do, and soon began to institute a policy of teaching them trade skills, valuable, valuable trade skills that they could take with them once they became of age and go into the job market and actually look for jobs in the field that they were trained in. And, you know, you, whether it's welding, farming, um, bricklaying, whatever you want to call it, the other one was music. And he was inspired by Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Singers, uh, to, and he began this sort of model to teach kids music as a way to potentially maybe raise some funds, but also teach them tangible skills, because Charleston had a rich musical tradition all on its own. And soon, by the end of 1892, and it's sort of its first full year, he had over 100 orphans under his care. Well, that musical idea quickly, quickly grew, and soon uh, he petitioned sort of citizens to you know, donate instruments. He petitioned for people to give uniforms. The Citadel actually donated some of their own tattered and sort of abandoned uniforms. And in fact, the picture you see above me is an early picture of the Jenkins Orphanage Band, as they were known, in those Citadel uniforms with some of these battered instruments that the Charleston residents donated to the cause. These instruments probably weren't getting much use after the war. Maybe you were too depressed to play. You had to get some work. It was depression. Not a good time. Probably didn't need it. You probably didn't play it. You gave it away. And luckily for us. The kids were taught by two local musicians, and they learned pretty quickly. By 1893, they were sent all around, pretty much all around, to play on street corners and sort of pass the hat performances. Uh, <clears throat> during the time they were not in school or learning active sort of things, the band would make tours of the United States, and that brought in some pretty good funding for the orphanage itself. And in fact, I'm thrilled that we can show you one of these early performances, because that's pretty important to see. So how do, why don't we check out this really cool clip of the Jenkins Orphanage Band. With, and I believe that where they're performing, it looks sort of like the old Citadel, but I can't be certain of that. But let's just enjoy <clears throat> this performance.
Okay. So not too different from sort of like a kind of, you, know, you go to a college football game. That's kind of what you're hearing today, isn't it? Um, in, a, in a sense. But uh, really, really cool. And you can see how engaging this group of kids is. Uh, not only playing, but the two little band leaders in front uh, turning around and engaging with the audience and dancing along with it. So they were really, really uh, meant to be pretty, pretty fun performances, engaging, and that's what made them so special. Well, um, not only did they get sent around Charleston to perform, but later around the United States, and soon quickly they began to make a name for themselves. And the band grew and grew and grew, and so did the orphanage. Because of their increased revenue streams and increased funding, they were able to bring in way more orphans by 360 by the end of 1893 and 500 by the end of 1894. Well, by that point, <clears throat> Pastor Jenkins was sending the bands up and down the East Coast each summer to give tours. This helped raise a lot of money, and it just came, became this beautiful sort of trickle effect where he could help more kids, and in turn, they helped the orphanage. And this sort of grew and grew and grew, and that was sort of a model that was used. No matter what the skill being taught was, whoever was the oldest, probably kids at the orphanage, eventually became the teachers. And it's no different in the music scene as well. In fact, one of his sons, pictured here, I'm not going to tell you which one just yet, I will in a second, don't worry, uh, eventually became the band leader and the conductor of the group when they went on their national tour, international tour, rather, should I say, in 1914. They were invited to London to play at the Anglo-American Exposition. But before that, by the way, the reason that they got that invitation is because they already played at two presidential inaugurations, President Roosevelt and Taft, and had their own stage at the St. Louis World's Fair, and were already a mainstay in most major metropolis-type areas in the Northeast. So, if you know, you 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 probably have have seen this group perform somewhere, in way, in one way or another, um, at the early 20th century. If you lived on the East Coast, and like I mentioned, <clears throat> they were invited to play in London, and so Pastor Jenkins sent his one of his sons. Mr. Edmund Thornton Jenkins as its band leader and, well, conductor. And he is pictured at the very bottom right of the screen. Actually, you know what? Let me put my face back to where it was. He's right above me now, uh, holding a clarinet here in the very bottom right corner of your screen. You know what? I will move my face here. He is standing stoically here in the corner, looking off to the side, a very polished hat and clarinet. He himself was a very, very good clarinetist. <clears throat> Let's tell you a little bit about him, actually. Uh, he, oop, uh, wrong thing I grabbed there. There we go. He was a clarinetist by trade, also a pianist and a vocalist. He was one of 11 total children the pastor had. He was his seventh son, and he was a very skilled musician. He would see performances at the Metropolitan Opera. He knew about Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He knew the music of Dvorak, more importantly, he knew the music of Will Marion Cook and Jim Ura, and those are names that eventually influenced him so much. In 1908, he attended Morehouse College for six years, mastered those three instruments he started learning at the Orphanage Band, and came back in 1914 to lead the band to London. When he went over to London with the band, he enrolled in the Royal Academy of Music <clears throat> and stayed there to study. Stayed, studied composition and clarinet, pretty much won every major award there you could possibly win, um, and was a very successful performer, and eventually professor as well, which is really, really amazing. This was meant to be the band's sort of global hello and welcome, but unfortunately, another war got in the way, World War I. And so it's another one of those what-if situations. I really wonder what would have happened to the Jenkins Orphanage Band had it not been for World War I. And the global focus shifted to, well, once again, recovery. <clears throat> By 1916, young Edmund was showing great promise. He would already write great pieces. By 1919, he arranged for Will Marion Cook's Southern Syncopated Orchestra to arrive in London in July, bringing really a new dance and jazz, sort of early, early jazz craze to Britain. He was, in fact, offered the leadership position of the SSO during that time, but turned it down because he wanted to stay there and work on his music and performing. Also didn't want to return to the States anytime soon. He saw what was happening in the States, especially in Charleston, and how segregated it still was. There was not going to be any opportunities for him, he felt, so he decided to stay in Europe. Uh, in, the, in 1919, he wrote a folk rhapsody, and it was premiered on a concert of works by 
Coleridge Taylor, and it was conducted by the composer himself. This was later expanded and reorchestrated in 1925 as Charleston, a folk rhapsody. And I, I would play you a clip of it, but let's give you a little bit. Oh, actually, no, no, no I have to play it a little bit for you because I'm going to. Uh, you'll see. So I'm going to play you a little clip of it, and this is important because we're performing this piece in February uh, along with a few others, um, and I want to showcase something to you. So I want you to listen carefully to the opening of this piece and tell me if something sounds familiar to you. English horn. Little Dvorak loops there on purpose in a pentatonic scale. Listen to this car solo. Okay, so now that we've listened to that piece, did you hear that? Did you hear what just happened in the clarinet solo? Does it sound like anything specifically to you? Hopefully it does. Uh, I will tell you that there is a, something should jump out at you about that clarinet solo. In fact, the low trill that you heard, and then the high note it goes to, and the gliss in the middle, and everything in between, this is very reminiscent of a piece by a composer we'll talk about here in a second. And yeah, this title of this piece eventually changed and grew, had many different iterations, eventually settling on the title Charlestonia. In fact, that's what it's known today. Uh, it's known today by that title. And why was it called that? He didn't call it the Charleston even though he wanted to, uh, nor did he call it Charleston Folk Rhapsody because there was another piece sweeping the nation at that time called the Charleston. Written by James P. Johnson, basically because he was influenced so much by the Jenkins Orphanage Band and loved the music of Charleston, he decided, you know, I gotta honor that musical tradition and write this tune with this really cool new dance that, oh, by the way, comes to us from those performances of the J.O.B. These street performances, where the kids are dancing and the music is playing, later grew into the Charleston. If you don't believe me, here's an early version of something that James P. Johnson may have seen on the street corners of Charleston or in New York City. We know he was here in, in Charleston at some point. We also know the Jenkins Band was up in New York, and it's very possible he may have seen something like this. <laughs> the idea this very much to me looks like the early steps of a Charleston and in fact that's exactly what it was so uh, let's dive back in here 
It first appeared in 1923 in the Broadway musical Runnin' Wild. Yeah, of course, don't forget that James P. Johnson was a Tin Pan Alley composer and Harlem jazz stride pianist, and so he would have been in the same circles as U.B. Blake, as George Gershwin, as Irving Berlin, etc. He would have been in this exact same circle of musicians. Uh, he was inspired, of course, by U.B. Blake's Charleston Rag from 21, and of course, observing, like I mentioned, all of these different dances and musical styles. The dancing, by the way, very traditional part of this music, and the steps have been seen uh, in places just Haiti, Cape Verde, the Ashanti tribe, but really come to us from that West African uh, tradition that was brought over to the U.S. through the slave trade. And thankfully, what came out of that is this Charleston dance that's sort of native to our land here. And it sort of pays homage to Charleston's role in the, in the development of, well, jazz, for lack of a better word. We often associate New Orleans as the home of jazz, the birthplace of jazz, Chicago as well. Charleston often got overlooked. I remember when I took my jazz history class in college that we never really talked about South Carolina and Charleston and its importance of jazz creation. But in fact, check this out. There's a quote here by Jack McRae. Well, New Orleans we know about, but Charleston is one of those cradles, the birthplaces of American improvisational music and a very important one. Well, at the end, turn of the 20th century, classical music was melting with these indigenous influences, initiating the shift to a distinctly American style of music and the emergence of native composers like George Gershwin. Antonin Dvorak famously once said, you know, the music here has to be tied to your folk cultures. You have to tap into that wealth and beauty of native music, the work songs, the field songs, the slave songs. All this rich culture. Oh, by the way, the Native American cultures and, and their songs and their music and all of this has to be the foundation of the bedrock of yours. Because guess what? The German romantic kind of orchestral romantic era of music. Yeah, we brought that here from Europe, but you have to find your own. And composers like Gershwin, like James P. Johnson, were doing exactly that. They were fusing and blending these styles into this really beautiful American mix of things. Uh, we mentioned George Gershwin, so why don't we actually talk about George Gershwin? And so his contribution to the American music scene, you, you can't speak enough about it, what he did. He reconciled so many different styles of music, himself being a popular song plugger on Tin Pan Alley, but also a very prominent pianist himself, imp you know, improvisational pianist. He wouldn't have played ragtime uh, and wasn't really proper at the time, but he would have been familiar with all these different styles. Oh, and by the way, he was heavily influenced by the music of Liszt, Dvorak, Brahms, Chopin. These are the composers that he grew up listening to and playing. And it's actually no surprise, nor is it shocking, that he uses these themes and textures and soundscapes very similar to Rachmaninoff and the music that Sergei Rachmaninoff would have been putting out at the time. In 1924, he composes Rhapsody in Blue. Do you remember the year that Charlestonia was written? Do you remember the year that Charleston was written? Hmm. By the way, what ensemble premiered uh, Rhapsody in Blue? Paul Whiteman's orchestra, which would have been very familiar with all of the current happenings in the jazz, stride, ragtime, Harlem uh, worlds. And, in fact, their musicians would have been as well. So here's my question to you. The clarinetist that performed Rhapsody in Blue, the very famous opening to the Rhapsody, is, of course, the clarinet solo. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay, because I'm here to help. I'm just, I'm, I'm here to help. And here's the opening solo to Rhapsody in Blue. Anyway, you get, you, I think the rest is history and the rest we know. Uh, but 
hopefully sounds familiar and sounds a little bit like Charlestonia. You can, you can easily kind of hear the similarities there. Well, clarinetist Ross Gorman was the one that actually sort of did that gliss initially. It's not what Gershwin had wrote, written, had written in his music originally, and Gorman played it and Gershwin went nuts. He said, yes, that, I need that, I want that. Well, why do you think he played it? Why would he have done that exactly? Uh, just a rhetorical question. Let us know in the comments below, of course, if you're still with us, what you think. And if you think there's a correlation here, is it possible that Mr. Ross Gorman had heard one of these Charlestonia performances? I don't know, because it's very, very, very almost impossible that Charlestonia was performed in the States um, prior to Rhapsody in Blue. But it's possible, I guess, in a sense. It's possible that somebody may have brought it over it's sort of an unspoken musical tradition type of thing. You know, somebody hears it in Europe, brings it back over here. Gorman hears it, plays it. Everybody goes nuts. So is it possible? Of course. Do we have the information? I don't know if we do, but what a cool concept, isn't it? What I think you do hear, though, is how unquestionably similar those two clarinet solos are, and it's in a beautiful way. Uh, these Charleston rhythms later appeared in more of Gershwin's works, like his Concerto in F, which really used James P. Johnson's music and his rhythms. This is a common thing Gershwin did. He took the, the, the most famous music of the time, whether it's popular or serious, and put it into his own language, into his own music. He, he was a beautiful melodist. He sort of had to be to write for Tim Pan Alley. And he wrote these beautiful, beautiful pieces, memorable themes, and it's easy to, to, to think why Rhapsody is so popular these days and how it's stuck in our heads all the time. It also didn't hurt that in, I believe it was the 80s, United Airlines chose Rhapsody in Blue as its sort of company song. It was the song played at the be beginning of the safety demonstrations. And from there, it sort of cemented its legacy as like the American piece of symphonic music. Well, it's pretty fitting that the American the defining pinnacle of American symphonic music has elements of jazz, Gullah Geechee culture in it, and pretty cool uh, romantic and Rachmaninoff influences as well at the same time. So pretty incredible how that all fits together. Uh, but he, you know, that, the correlation to Charleston didn't end there for Gershwin. He, of course, himself was fascinated with the area. As was Dvorak, by the way. Dvorak was so close to coming to Charleston. I really, it's another what if in history. Uh, what if he had come to Charleston instead of going to Iowa when he did? But, uh, of course, he went to Charleston in the 30s. Uh, but before that, he, of course, saw this really important play by DuBose Hayward, who wrote a novel about a crippled street beggar from Charleston. Hayward featured the Gullah language and culture as a main element of the story and developed it into a play of the same name in the 1927. The J.O.B. featured prominently in the novel and actually played in person live for the entire duration of the Broadway run of Porgy, not the opera, the play, the DuBose Hayward play that opened on, in 1927. Of course, that comes to us after Rhapsody in Blue, so there's no correlation there, but... This shows you how important the J.O.B. was to the musical landscape and to the history of Charleston as a community at that time. Gershwin read the novel in 26, saw the play in 29, wanted to do an opera in 33. Well, in 34, they both come to visit South Carolina. They stayed on Folly Beach and attended Gullah services, lived in their culture, took note of their native sort of Charleston street music, and the cries of the vendors and their unique melodic inflections wrote this all down and eventually put them into uh, the masterpiece, which would be Porgy and Bess, the folk opera as it's known, um, and sort of the American defining point of opera at that point in time. And so, you know, tying this all together, since we're running low on time, uh, today, I think what you can say, that by the way, that's Maestro Yuri Becker there conducting the Charleston Symphony, what looks like the opening of Spoleto Week. Absolutely beautiful. Today we have this beautiful, vibrant, diverse, cosmopolitan, European, African, Latin, American, whatever you want to call it, uh, beautiful music tradition here in, the, in, in, in town. 
Um, at the heart of it all, I want to say is Ranky Tanky, uh, who is keeping these really amazing traditions alive from the Gullah, Gullah tradition. And I want to give you a little taste of that. If you've not seen Ranky Tanky performed, well, you're in for a treat. So here's a little bit of Green Sally up, Green Sally down, Green Sally bake a possum brown. Green Sally up, Green Sally down, Green Sally bake a possum brown. Green Sally up. Green Sally down, Green Sally bake a possum brown. Green Sally up, Green Sally down, Green Sally bake a possum brown. Anyway, great, 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 great entertainment, um, but also importance uh, in so many different ways. Um, and let's get back in here. We've already mentioned Darius Rucker and the influence of country here. We all know how important country music is. Jazz as well. We mentioned jazz and, and how that's just such a vibrant part of this community. One of the only towns in America that has actually a professional jazz big band uh, at its musical core. Uh, and important, really important work done being at the Avery Research Center, at College of Charleston, at various different collectives that are helping to tell the tale of the history of this art form and its beautiful connection to the city here. Because a lot, a lot has happened. Of course, his classically speaking, Spoleto Festival, the thing that's happening every year in the summer that brings thousands upon thousands of people to our community, created in 1977 by Giancarlo Minotti, is a unique sort of festival, a counterpart of the Festival of Two Worlds in Italy. And so you're bringing this European sensibility and high culture here. Oftentimes at the centerpiece of it all are sort of forgotten or underperformed operas from history. In 2010, a, an amazing part of history uh, was done when the first ever opera that was performed in, in the U.S. was redone. Flora was recreated in 2010 by composer Neely Bruce to mark the renovation of the Dock Street Theater. We mentioned opera and its new burgeoning Developments, Charleston Opera Theater, Holy City Arts and Lyric Opera, both sort of new companies in the area. The Med Broadcasts, Met Broadcasts, goodness, you can see those in theaters all over town. Um, sort of a really cool way to see the Met, but not have to go to New York for it. And of course, the College of Charleston Opera presents its own main stage productions and as some educational outreach efforts as well. So things are just alive and they're kicking orchestras, we know the Charleston Symphony, Summerville Orchestra, Mount Pleasant Symphony. There's a great number of ch uh, chamber music performances here in town, uh, sort of at the, at the heart of it all is chamber music Charleston. Uh, I believe there's performances this weekend coming up anyway. It's a con it continues the tradition of chamber music that thrived here in the 20s, and then thrived here pretty much any time there was a war. After the war, chamber music was at the heart of it all, because, well, that makes sense. You want intimate settings. You can't afford to have a big orchestra on stage, so you come to hear these small groups. That's still at the heart of uh, the music scene here. And so basically, to sum up, Charleston today is very much the same as Charleston of old. There's a very rich and important um, religious and sacred music tradition here in town. There's a very important old secular tradition here in town. Opera has always been at the heart of Charleston, and it's sort of trying to make a comeback now. Thanks to Spoleto and thanks to these new companies that are here in town, hopefully trying to get a foothold. Uh, but our past has greatly shaped and influenced our current musical climate. Um, a lot of, a lot of European kind of des desirability to have that sort of orchestral classical choral tradition, as well as the importance of the religious music, as well as the importance of these folk native musics here in town, all have come together to form this melting pot. Uh, of American music, and I think it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be in the world, not only because of the colors you see in the photo behind you, but also because of the cultures that are being preserved and the music that's being played and the stories being told. It's a great place to be. So if you don't live here, get down here. If you'd like to know more, you want to have a bit of a chance to talk to me more about this, please go ahead and email me for a, for a full list of my sources. And of course, to hear more of these compositions, Charlestonian, Rhapsody in Blue, The Charleston, all of these pieces are actually going to be on our next concert in February. 
uh, in a few weeks, my goodness, time flies. We are performing this concert um, at the Somerville Perf Summer's Corner Performing Arts Center uh, up here in Somerville. So make sure you grab a ticket if you don't have one yet. Here are some really cool sources. I'll leave them on the screen here. And quickly, I will just say thank you so much for tuning in, for staying around. Hopefully this was an entertaining part of your evening, and hopefully you learned some things and well, got something out of it. So I just want to say thank you for being here, and stay tuned to our social media um, to, well, basically keep in the know about when the next music chats with Voitech is going to be. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you in the concert hall.